explosion, man. If, if somebody's in there, they're dead, man. Police say five children and two adults were killed by what they are calling a devastatingly quick moving fire. We do know that this was a, uh, an intentional human act and this was a set fire. The video showed a suspect. There were three attempts to light the home on fire. You know, Angela was white, Dennis was black. I could see people not liking that. Patrick had set Angela on fire 12 years prior and went to prison for it for an extended period of time. I've never had fatal fire happen twice on the same street. He felt like he was, uh, I guess, an angel of the neighborhood. That God placed him in the neighborhood to watch over it. The key is, who was the man running down the street? His intent, his plan was to kill them. All nine of these people knew they were going to die. That was his plan. This is what he's gonna tell you. You know how to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We the jury and to find the defendant. I got a fire going on Fulton Avenue. It's fully engulfed. I think there's people in the house. I heard a lot of bang. I looked out and this house was gone. It's poison, man. It's right up here close. I can feel the heat. The lights are going out. It's burning quick, man. If somebody's in there, they're dead, man. Hey, they're on their way right now. Oh, my God. It was the first of what would be two fatal fires on the very same block. That fire resulted in the deaths of two people, Gloria Hart and Lindell Lewis, and they both perished in the upstairs bathroom of that structure. They were yelling for help and people were trying to help them and they just could not get out. They were an elderly couple and the smoke just, you know, uh, you know got to them. Lewis was a family man loved by many who often spent time with his children and grandchildren. He was a good person. He was a God-fearing person. The investigators from the Ohio State Fire Marshal's office became very uh, suspicious of the fire based on the burn patterns on the outside of the house. And they noticed that Lindell Lewis and Gloria Hart had a video system on their uh, house. The video showed a suspect there were three attempts to light the home on fire, so you would see a figure walking to the house, uh, attempting to light the fire. You could see clearly the individual in like a jumpsuit and uh, spraying the actual food on the home. There was a partial um, section of the face, but you couldn't identify at the time. Uh, the individual involved. Lindell Lewis uh, actually did have a lot of shadier people hanging around at his house. One person actually had set his car on fire in the side of his house a few years prior. He had two people living in his basement at the time of the fire. Those, uh, those people living in the basement of the home had some angry drug dealers they were mad at them because they were giving them drugs on consignment. They were not paying uh, what they were supposed to be paying. And there were also questions about the ex-wife of Lindell Lewis. First words out of her mouth without being questioned were, um, I had nothing to do with this. And more questions about a neighbor by the name of Stanley Ford. He felt he was kind of a watchman of the neighborhood and he watched over the neighborhood for the elderly uh, residents. He stated that he would take naps during the daytime so we could be up at night looking over the neighborhood. He felt that God placed him in the neighborhood to watch over it. He 
felt like he was, uh, I guess, an angel of the neighborhood, his actual words. We found out that there had been arguments between the two neighbors. It was an ongoing thing between the two neighbors. He uh, claimed that uh, Gloria Hart and Lindell Lewis's home had uh, prostitution going on in and out of there. They said it was drug usage, according to him. And Mr. Lewis was concerned about Mr. Ford's behavior, their arguments, and that he may uh, initiate or do something to him. This, uh, Mr. Ford? Yeah. Yeah, I was calling to follow up with you about the fire across the street. Um, a couple of things. Akron Police Detective Tanisha Stewart questioned Ford several times. So well, one major thing, um, is, you know, keeps coming up. You know, because of the tumultuous history that you and the people in Lindell's house had, everybody is thinking you, right? I don't know. I never heard that, Tanisha. Oh, yeah. That's that's the running thing. No, Tanisha, listen to me once again. I do not mess with these people up here. Mm -hmm. I them, them guys try to get me to come on and engage with them. Them guys was nasty. They was they had prostitutes in and out all night. Mm -hmm. they, they was dealing with homosexuality. Really? My Where you get that from? Oh, huh? what you mean where I get it from? Yeah, I mean, He's I... on the porch. I, that's why they mess with them. He did not, uh, you know, express any sadness towards Lindell passing away. Uh, he actually told the investigators a lot of real mean things about Lindell Lewis and Gloria Hart. Them people was just bad people. I didn't do nothing to them people. Them people were just mean. I mean, listen here. When they moved up here to Tunisia, they stole everything that wasn't voted down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They stole everything from people. Everything. Well, Mr. Ford, this is my concern. What's your concern? Is it how to make people believe that it wasn't you. I'm telling you, you listen, Tanisha, you either take my word or you don't. That's all I can tell you. Well, we do have another option. What's that? The polygraph. They had some motive evidence that it was Stanley. Um, they were definitely suspicious of him. We spent hours and hours and hours reviewing that video, trying to uh, get different angles on it. It was very heartbreaking um, because we knew in our heart and our minds and our gut feelings that we just knew it was Stanley Ford. But we just could not give that 100% identification. And Ford declined to take a polygraph test. It was really a, a tough decision for them. They didn't feel as though they had enough evidence to arrest anyone. And that all changed on May 15th of 2017. We have a fire on Fourth Avenue. Another fire on the same block. And so I just said to myself, uh, not again. This time, seven people would die. Five of them killed. What's the address of the fire? I don't know. It's, it's, it's almost gone. The whole house is almost burnt up. It just did another big old boom. It just keeps on popping like it's a explosion. That's what woke me up. Tragedy for certain in Akron tonight, where police say five children and two adults were killed by what they are calling a devastatingly quick moving fire. That was the worst fire fatality incident I've ever seen in the city of Akron. The fire started on the outside of the structure and there was no other exits to leave the house from the second floor. The bodies were discovered in the uh, second floor bedroom. Um, the parents uh, were on top of uh, three of the young children. Um, and uh, another child was found inside the room along with their family dog. The oldest child was found inside of a stairway. They were choking uh, essentially to death uh, based on the smoke and the carbon monoxide that, you know, overtook them. 
tonight we have the photos of those children to put a face to the names that are making all of this news. They are one-year-old Cameron Huggins, three-year-old Olivia Huggins, five-year-old Kylie Huggins, six-year-old Dicea Huggins, 14-year-old Jared Boggs, the father Dennis Huggins, the mother Angela Boggs. The way they described how the family uh, was discovered with Dennis and Angela covering, you know, the children, you know, uh, just safety in his arms. And I know the children didn't know what was going on exactly, but I know they felt safe. Tonight, we're hearing from the families left devastated. They were everything to me. I just hope that Brittany and her grandma and her aunts and uncles and her family get the answers that they deserve. I was in the fire investigation unit for 22 years. I've never had a f fatal fire happen twice on the same street within that short a period of time. But the initial speculation focused on some kind of an accident in the home Dennis Huggins had recently renovated. I mean, they did everything from the bottom all the way up to that electrical. And so that was like one of the initial thoughts in the beginning is like, man, I bet Dennis, I oh, know it had to be faulty wires or something. We looked at all accidental causes. We looked at the uh, utilities coming in. We looked at the front porch area. Sources with the fire department tell Channel 3 News that hot charcoal from a Mother's Day barbecue may have been dumped into a trash container and left near the front of the home, which sustained the heaviest damage. We looked all around, outside, inside, and ruled out all accidental causes. I mean, the last thing you want to think about is someone intentionally doing something like this, causing a tragedy like this. But within days, a person of interest emerged. Angela Boggs, former husband, Patrick Boggs. Police used a parole violation to bring him in for questioning. And the reason why they were suspicious of Patrick Boggs was because Patrick um, had set Angela on fire um, 12 years prior and went to prison for it for an extended period of time. He was not a, a very a nice um, uh, person and um, he had abused her and uh, set her on fire. He was definitely a prime suspect at the time, or the initial uh, person of interest. We initiated contact with him, his location, his whereabouts, uh, his, vi his uh, vehicle, cell phones. They got video from his, uh, his apartment complex in Ravenna, Ohio, and they realized that uh, he had never left that uh, apartment complex. So he was uh, initially eliminated and Mr. Ford became more of interest. Stanley Ford, the man who claimed he was the block's guardian angel and was already on a list of suspects because of the fire a year earlier on the same block. We said, well, Mr. Ford, we talked to all the neighbors. We want you to come downtown, talk with us like everyone else has. But well, I have a right. Uh, I'll have to go downtown. Uh, he was very reluctant and actually refused. And uh, he was in denial, very um, standoffish. Man, listen, they treat me like I'm a suspect, man. I'm not a suspect. So it actually worked out in our favor because we initiated the search warrant of his residences. Ford was patted down for any weapons and kept outside while the detectives carry out the search, looking for anything that might have been used to start the fire and accelerate. We identified um, an accelerant on his tennis shoes that he had thrown in the trash we discovered during the search warrant. When he learned that we actually recovered the tennis shoes from his home and uh, he was, well, I, I used my boots for um, cutting the grass. So he's still in denial the entire time of his involvement. Yeah, this is totally wrong, man. And at one point he mentioned, well, I was asleep and my wife woke me up. His wife looked at him startled like, so that stood out to me and uh, we knew there was something else, uh, something wrong. While the face of the suspect was not visible in the surveillance videos from the first fire, and this video showing the suspect after the second fire, investigators thought they saw a telling indicator. So when we did the uh, search warrant on his house, I uh, asked one of our investigators to keep a video camera directly on him. We matched his walk from 
the scene of that fire, and it was an exact match on his walk and his gait. Even Ford's wife seemed to think so. We showed her the video of him walking to and from the figure, walking to and from the house, and then the figure running to the fire, setting the fire, running back to his mother's home. She actually broke down crying and said, that's not the person I married. Ford had refused to go downtown to the police station, but he did agree to go with Detective Troy Looney to talk in the detective's car. Which actually worked out better because it was more personable one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, y'all put me in jail. No, listen, listen to what I'm saying to you, Stanley. This is so wrong, Stanley, man. listen to what I'm saying to you, Embarrassing okay? to my name. Listen to what I'm saying to you. You, know, you mentioned some things last night about some bad people at the house, or? Well, to, to, to me, I thought they was well, bad kids. Bad. Well, they, the stuff, they was just doing immature stuff in the neighborhood. Like what? Shit, uh, kicking the uh, vehicles, uh, rear view mirrors, busting them out and stuff like that. Is that a good way to get rid of somebody moving out the neighborhood and get rid of that? No, I, would, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it like that. Why, Why would I do it? that? I wouldn't do it at all. I ain't gonna set somebody on fire just to, uh, to get them out of the neighborhood. Maybe they're intended. That, that, Maybe they're intended. Uh, uh, that's, that, that, that ain't, that ain't, I mean, that ain't godly like, like, man. That well, ain't, I know that. That ain't human nature well, like, that. man. Yeah, that's evil. That's pure evil, right? That, man, I'm not evil, man. Well, filled the sky in memory of six-year-old Deja Huggins, one of the five children killed in Monday's deadly fire. She loved balloons and she loved the color pink. I know she's going to really like them. She was my best friend and my always best friend. She always played with me. It was the very same day that investigators ruled the fire was not an accident, but an act of arson. I, man, I, I tell you, it hurts. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts. You know, arson was the last thing on my mind. Let me put it like that. I don't know Dennis to have any enemies. I don't know Angela to have any enemies other than her uh, ex-husband, you know, Angela was white, Dennis was black, I could see people not liking that, but Dennis never mentioned anybody having any problems with it. We're in the sixth floor, room number four, DB. And with Stanley Ford, Mr. Ford, uh, I'm gonna read your rights to you. Detectives Troy Looney and John Bell had now ruled out all but one suspect, Stanley Ford. I just want to talk to you. We want to talk to you. I want you to be honest with me. Okay. Be honest. Let's talk about, about today in question. Let's go back to the fire. Okay. What about it? Okay. What can you tell us about the fire? I don't have no knowledge of that. So what's the point? Detectives told Ford about the surveillance videos they had collected from both fires, including this pivotal video of a suspect walking down the street just before the second fire started. Mr. Ford exits his home at that time, roughly after midnight, and is moving about the neighborhood. Right before the fire, we see movement from Mr. Ford's home to his mother's home, around the neighborhood, and then the, Mr. Ford walks down the street the fire is ignited, he, uh, the figure runs back to his mother's home, and then that video was very significant because it showed him leaving his mother's home, activating and deactivating the alarms, going back to his home inside his door. And it, the times fit exactly with the video as to when someone was coming in and out of the house. And Ford finally acknowledged he was walking around the neighborhood that night. I don't know what time it was. You know, sometimes like I explained to him, you know, I exercise some I get Charlie horses. Right? Sometimes I walk the street and back, you know what I mean? Something like that. But uh, I I didn't do that fire, man. I ain't gonna sit accept that. And he mentioned he never saw a fire, uh, still in denial. He claimed he was sleeping next to his wife, but you know, we know that not to be the case. We got you running back to the house mm -hmm. at the time of the fire. Okay, right. we got you running to the house, okay? All right, 
you're telling us you sleep. Right. You're not asleep. You are. You're on the camera, Stanley. I want to know. I want to know camera running from the fire. Stanley, you're on the. I'm on camera running from a fire. We got you. You're. Yeah. I was I ain't run from no fire. Stanley, listen. Yeah. It's time to come. It's time. It's time. To Man, tell listen. Tell Stanley, listen. Stanley, listen. Yeah. Yeah. We know the answers, okay? Right. Okay. But I ain't running from. I wasn't running from no fire. Okay. You walk. You you're see you see the fire. Okay. You're I ain't at the fire. No, no, no. I'm not at no fire. You're at the fire. I'm at a fire? Yeah, yes. you're at the fire. You were there. You were there. You're on the camera, Stan? I, I got, got you. No fire, man. Yeah, we got Tell us about. Yeah, we got a witness, Stan. Okay, yeah. Stan. Yeah. And I said, well, I know it's you, so tell me why. Why why you did this or why this happened. And he still was in denial. Okay. We need to hear your side of the story. Johnny, I'm being honest, man. I, I didn't do anything. I mean, I can't I can't look to somebody and do what I want to do that did that. I don't have, I got too much to lose, man. I don't want him to tell me why are they bad people. Do they threaten you or make comments to you? Is uh, to kind of, all of this to get to why this took place or why this would have happened. We got all the pieces, we know the answers. This is what we want to know. Is there some reasoning or some kind of something that happened, man, somebody pissed you off or somebody do something? No. To maybe, maybe why, maybe, like I said, maybe you're trying to send a message. Uh-uh. Okay. I wasn't at nobody on fire. I'm allowed to walk in the neighborhood. I wasn't at nobody's house. If I'm walking. It's why you running, running back from the house. I wasn't running back from no house. You were running back from the house. I ain't running back from no house. I just showed you, man. Man, I ain't running back from no house. I just showed you, but I ain't running from no house. I ain't running from no house. 20 seconds, man. 20. I didn't do that, man. I didn't do that. 20 I seconds. Yeah, I'm telling you, I got the wrong. <coughs> well, you know we go. Okay, we got you. I got you. Prosecutors were prepared to bring charges of murder. He had to have known that they may not get out of that house when he sets their house on fire at two o'clock in the morning, that they may never get out after he's killed two other people. So I think his intent was very, very clear to kill. The reason you're here, we signed a warrant for you because like I said in the car before, if I prove it, we proved it. Y'all believe that I did it? No, no, we proved that you've done it. I didn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to did that, man. Well, do you want me to explain the charges to you or do you want to explain them? I didn't do it. I'm serious, I didn't do it. I'm not gonna admit to that. I didn't do it. If I did, I admit to it. I didn't do that. Let me explain your charges. Go ahead. Okay. You have seven counts of aggravated murder. We do know that this was a uh, an intentional human act, and this was a set fire. The news has shocked this community, leaving some speechless over the arrest of 58-year-old Stanley Ford. But to know that somebody in the neighborhood would do that, I mean, that's terrible. Couldn't believe it. I mean, all you can ask is why, you know, why? why? Never heard of him, didn't even know the guy was on planet Earth. Nobody knows that you have to walk on eggshells in your neighborhood. We are live in the Stanley Ford case. He faces 28 counts in all, and prosecutors are pursuing the death penalty. So this morning, the jury was taken out to the scenes of the crimes. Uh, they saw where this happened. It's called a jury view. Counsel will now give opening statements. And with that, Mr. D'Angelo, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Ryan. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a very, very difficult case for you all to hear. I think you all understand the importance of it. I've never had an arson homicide in my career. It is a very, very unusual way to um, uh, kill people. Prosecutor Joe D'Angelo knew that the case would depend on proving the man seen running from the fire was indeed Stanley Ford who had grown a beard and long hair since his arrest. And ladies and gentlemen, the evidence, all of that will reveal his identity. And that will be, and that will show you that when the defendant gets angry with his neighbors, he sets their property on fire and he kills them. Stanley Ford 
uh, not only intended to kill these folks, but all nine of them knew that they were going to die. May I please court, counsel, standing forward. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We knew that we had a very steep hill to climb immediately. And for lawyers Scott Riley and Joe Gorman, a difficult client in Stanley Ford, who even before the trial started, had objected to his lawyer's plans to argue he had a serious brain disorder and should not face the death penalty. I didn't commit a crime to be put in to deal with all these competencies and these different uh, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and stuff. Does that make any sense, you know? But I gotta tell you, it's incumbent upon you to cooperate with Dr. Karkowicz. I'm not saying a doctor, Your Honor. I'm not going down with it. I'm not saying no more doctors. Stanley wanted to fire us, wanted to represent himself. And had filed bar complaints against us with the Supreme Court, saying that we weren't doing our jobs effectively, saying that we were, um, in, in effect, working with the state in order to have him convicted. And you understand that that could be a, a result of the brain damage that we know exists. It wasn't going to hurt our feelings, and we were still going to do our job to the best of our abilities. By the time of the trial, Ford had dropped his complaints about his lawyers and their defense strategy. Scott Riley handled the opening, focused on the prosecution's weakest point. The videos are grainy at best. Not a single witness is going to come in and talk to you and tell you that that image that they see, they can tell a standing for. Motive is not enough. Hold the state to that burden of proof. And when you do that, you'll we'll know they have not proven Stanley Ford's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution began with neighbors of the house on Fultz Avenue, where the five children and two parents died, testifying by Zoom because of the pandemic. Do you recall ever having a conversation with the defendant, Stanley Ford, about the residents of that house? He mentioned to me that there was a, a little boy that lived in the house that was breaking off rearview mirrors. And then testimony on Ford's complaints about the Lindell Lewis house that was set on fire in 2016. And he said, well, there's a lot of traffic in and out of the house and I have girls. And he thought that the gentlemen were being rude, you know, I mean, cursing and doing drugs out on the property. And just so we're clear, um, that was Stanley Ford who told you that? That was Stanley who told me what Lindell had said. We call Troy Looney. Detective, Detective Troy Looney was the key witness for the prosecution, needed to introduce the interrogation tapes of Stanley Ford. The parts where he makes admissions about going down to the end of the street, for example, in the second fire, um, and not being able to explain why he was down there. And at any point during the rest of this interview, did he ever explain to you or give you a reason why he was down there? He did not. We also wanted them to hear the parts of the uh, interviews where he was uh, talking about those victims uh, in both fires. Those people was just bad people. Once again, that fit with our motive, that this was his motive, that he was not pleased because they were causing problems in his neighborhood, and he wanted to take care of that. Mr. Foreman, cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. But the detective and the videos were also important to the defense case. Good morning, detective. Good morning. Making the argument that the detective took advantage of Stanley Ford. Yeah, and I go back to the brain damage that that played a part in him continuing to talk to the police officers, having a false belief that he could somehow talk his way out of the box that they were trying to trap him in. And he was probably, I'm assuming, handcuffed to the table and then you left him in there for a while by himself, correct? Yes. And that's kind of an interrogation technique from the Akron Police Department, isn't it? Uh, it's more so just in preparation and going in to talk to him. Okay. In transportation. He's an uneducated guy dealing with a lead detective who's got a, a, a bunch of college degrees and he's trained in these interrogation techniques to try and get Stanley. In other words, it was no match. You've told him over and over and over again, we see you on video walking up the street, don't you? Yes. 
Yeah, you're yes. at the fire. You're there. there. You're there. You're on the camera, Stan. I, I got, got you. No fire, man. The truth is, Detective, when you look at that video, you can't discern who that individual is by looking at their face on that video, can you? Not by face, but by travel, location, path to and from, and it, all the other factors that we went to play. And the defense drilled down on why police had dismissed Patrick Boggs, the ex-husband of Angela, as a suspect. You knew during the course of your investigation in 2001 that Patrick Boggs tried to set Angela Boggs on fire, correct? Correct. Also beat her up, correct? Correct. Poured kerosene all over her and tried to light her while she was in a bathtub, is that fair? That's fair. You also knew as you interviewed Patrick Boggs that there was a racial component to what happened in 2001, fair? Yes. He believed, he believed she was cheating on him with a black man, correct? Correct. That piqued your interest in this case too because of who Angelo Boggs was now dating, fair? That's correct. And I mean, that's the nature of their, it's their job to, as we call muddy the waters, and uh, it's their job to um, create some kind of doubt if they can. And under Ohio law, the results of Boggs' polygraph test could not be introduced as evidence. Uh, Mr. Boggs actually had passed the polygraph at that time. That was something we couldn't mention in trial. So all the jury knew was that the victim's ex-husband, Patrick Boggs, had already been convicted once of trying to set her on fire, and that Boggs was of the same height and build as the person seen in the surveillance videos, and that Boggs did not like his ex-wife living with a black man. Go ahead and have a seat, Mr. Boggs. So. Mr. Boggs, um, you have been subpoenaed to testify um, in this case. Patrick Boggs was the only witness called by the defense. And at this time, do you choose to testify? I choose fifth, plead a fifth and not testify at all. So you're choosing to in, um, in, invoke your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That was the defense strategy show the jury a man who would not answer questions about the fires because it might implicate him in a crime. There was one final piece of business before the closing arguments. Under the Fifth Amendment, you have a right to testify or a right not to testify. You understand that? Yeah, and have and you have you decided not to testify? I did. I thought that was the right decision in this case. Stanley is not going to be any match for a cross examination by a seasoned prosecutor, and they had two seasoned prosecutors on this case. And with that, Mr. Uh, D'Angelo, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Your Honor. The key is. Who was the man running down the street? And it was the defendant in this case, Stanley Ford. There can be no doubt at that point, ladies and gentlemen, that his intent, his plan was to kill them. All nine of these people knew they were going to die, the evidence has shown. And so did the defendant, because that was his plan. He's our worst nightmare. He's a fallen angel who operates in darkness. Find him guilty and hold him accountable. Thank you. The families of the victims had packed the Ohio courtroom looking for some understanding of why it happened. At least in Hollywood, they have a plot and you understand the reason. Not the case here. And the Huggins family became upset as defense lawyer Joe Gorman laid out his case. I don't know if Dennis Huggins never met him. But I do know he was a drug dealer. So we. Oh, that, that offended me. That offended me a lot. And I know it was their job to try to make Dennis and Angela seem like they were unfit and, you know, brought trouble to the neighborhood and things like that. But anybody that knew Dennis and Angela, they knew better. If it was such an open and shut case, because we got on video, uh, the grainy figure on video and the door cracking, and we've got an alarm system. You know, the alarm system, we got it being deactivated, and says Stanley Ford, if it's such a great case, why do they gotta get him to confess? 
You're there. You're on the camera, Stan. I got you. No fire, man. Yeah, we got to tell us about. Yeah, we got a witness. Stan. Okay. Why are they pressing them so hard? It doesn't make sense. They don't care about the other possible suspects. They don't look at the other possible suspects. They don't even focus on the other suspects. The reason we point these suspects out and we point out the lack of investigation as, to, as it relates to the rest of the suspects is because it creates doubt. Can I sit here and tell you it was one person and not the other? I cannot. That's what God's doing. It took the jury two full days to reach a verdict. Would you hand the verdict forms to Mr. Mason, please? We, the jury, being duly paneled and sworn and affirmed to well and truly try and do due deliverance made between the state of Ohio and the defendant Stanley O. Ford do find the defendant guilty of the offense of aggravated murder. Guilty of 22 of 25 counts, all but the deaths of the family dog and an unrelated car fire in the neighborhood. You can't really go through something like this without being changed. Um, these are seeing things in there as things I've never seen in my life, never thought I would see, never thought I would have to see. Now, the defense team would have to fight to keep Stanley Ford from being sentenced to death. When you get involved in a death penalty case, you have to prepare for the worst case scenario. We, we started planning for it four and a half years earlier when we put the mitigation team together. So, all the brain scans and tests they had doctors conduct on Stanley Ford, which he had so objected to, would now come into play. Stanley had uh, pneumonia about two months prior to the first fire in this case. It can trigger um, many strokes um, in someone's brain, especially of Stanley's age. It can affect their ability to exercise self-control. Under Ohio law, the jury must vote unanimously to impose a death sentence. So we knew going in, our game plan was, number one, we've got to reach at least one juror who believes that this horrific case, in this horrific case, that a life sentence is more appropriate. The jury vote was 11 for the death penalty, one against. And so this one juror just did not feel comfortable with that even though they were 11 to one and 11 other people wanted to do it, she was very, very, uh, you know, uh, troubled by his mental health issues. So she chose a life sentence. And as he left the courtroom, he did give a small wave to the camera. This recommendation today goes to the judge who will have the final say in what Ford's sentence will be. And the judge wanted Ford to hear from the families of his victims before she imposed her sentence. And I do want to just say, me personally, um, I do forgive uh, Mr. Ford, um, but the purpose that I came here to focus on today is not Mr. Ford or his crimes, um, but to focus uh, simply on setting the record straight. And I, I wanted him to know that, you know, I don't want you to think that you killed a thug. You know, he wasn't an angel. He wasn't an angel. He smoked weed, sold a little bit of weed also, but he only sold enough weed to smoke for free, you know, and, and, and get, a, get some groceries. They were a young, blended, multiracial family working hard to achieve the American dream just like you or me. Um, were they perfect? No. Did they deserve to die? No. Church is in our veins, and Dennis is cut from that same cloth. I just want to say to you, Mr. Ford, that I love you, man. I forgive you. Am I still hurt? Yes. Uh, am I? Do I get angry? Yes. Do I? Yes. All of the above. You can check all the boxes. Uh, but at the end of the day, his fate does not rest in my anger. It rests in the hands of God and there's nothing I can do about it. Do you wish to make a statement at this time? No, Your Honor, I think the family is going to be You know, I've lived with this case for four and a half years, and I still struggle. I cannot come up with words. You know, normally I'm a pretty straightforward shooter, shoot from the hip kind of person. But I struggle knowing you are all out there. On behalf of the Huggins, thank you. 
for the insight into their family. I don't think any of us knew that. The compassion that the Huggins' family has shown you, that you refuse to show your neighbors, is if you show them half of that, they would still be alive today. You may have gotten to know them. You may have found that you liked them. Instead of accusing them of being homosexuals, of being alcoholics, of being gamblers. But you chose to take it into your own hands. You chose to seek revenge. I disagree with that, man. You have an opportunity to talk, you're done. It's my turn. I have sat on my hands for four and a half years. And to what? Not a word, Mr. Ford. And to watch that video and to watch you enter that house. Knowing that the first one you said killed two people. And knowing that you were setting the second one, that there were seven people in that house. And you still chose to do that in the cover of darkness. Knowing that those houses go up in a blade. It is the most atrocious version of these types of offenses that could possibly happen. And while you have maintained your innocence throughout this trial, you have shown not a shred of sympathy or remorse during this four and a half years. So Mr. Ford, please rise. I'm imposing a life in prison without the possibility of parole based on the verdict of the jury. Nine life sentences consecutive to each other without the possibility of parole. I've seen people get the death penalty for a lot less, but I, I feel like uh, life in prison is harder and you're gonna have to live a prison life of a, a child killer, a baby killer, an arsonist. So I'm okay with life. I will order that on the following dates you will be held in solitary confinement. May 17th, April 18th, December 8th, December 23rd. January 10th and January 15th. So he has to be in solitary confinement for every one of the children's birthdays and the dates of each fire. So he'll be remembering them as well. Mr. Ford, I hope God has mercy on your soul and I hope at some point in time you seek the mercy and the forgiveness of your creator.